Welcome to the Dirty Verdict Podcast, where your hosts, trial lawyers Kyle Herbert and Bill Ogden, and mediator Peter Taff, talk with interesting lawyers and break down recent legal news in detail. Here's Kyle, Bill, and Peter. All right, welcome back to another edition of the Dirty Verdict Podcast. I am full-time mediator Peter Taff. I am full-time litigator Kyle Herbert. Special note, our sidekick, Bill Ogden, is not going to be with us this week. But uh, you can send him your uh, good thoughts and wishes via the uh, podcast mailbox. He is doing something much more important. He is meeting the teacher for his child. So that was an excused absence. I call it babysitting. He calls it parenting. That's true. That's true. All right. Well, we have a very special guest today, uh, Mano Diala, who is a state representative representing District 133. 33. Here in West, well, I don't consider that really West Harris County, but kind of near West Harris County, I would say. Also a lawyer with the Buck Keenan Law Firm. So thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you guys for having me. Uh, This is monumental for a couple of reasons. One, we've never had a state representative. So thank you. Uh, Two, we really haven't had anyone who's with a business litigation background, particularly an international one like yourself. So uh, we appreciate it. We're going to hopefully dig deep into that. A lot of stuff that you do uh, is super interesting. And I think a lot of people think they may know what what it's like, but uh, I think they probably are going to learn that's quite different. We're, we're all going to learn a lot today. That, that's what we're counting on. Okay. So first and foremost, we w- always like to learn a little bit, everyone does, about uh, your background and where you grew up, what, um, where you went to school, those kinds of things. So where are you from originally? Perfect. Um, I guess born in Dallas, but grew up in Houston. So it's a second grade. And um, and then kind of going back a little further, I'm the fifth of five sons of my parents immigrated from Cuba with my two older brothers. So it's kind of a different dynamic coming in and, and coming to Texas with this uh, very Hispanic background um, uh, from a country that is, I guess, was challenged at the time, uh, still is. Um, and coming in and growing up in this atmosphere. It's, it's been a blessing for all of us. I mean, my four brothers and I, this has been a wonderful experience. I mean, I think the answer is clear, but did you have, ever ask your parents why from Dallas to Houston? I mean, it's pretty obvious, I think, to everybody in Houston, but I'll give you a chance to, did you ever talk to your parents about that? Look, spending a lot of time, a lot of my career at Thompson Knight in Houston, uh, we used to say the best thing coming out of Dallas is I-45 South. Sure. So that should answer your question, obviously. <laughs> So you grew up uh, in the Spring Branch area of right. town? So I um, grew up here, went to schools here, uh, Memorial High School, went to the University of Texas, uh, business finance degree, uh, spent uh, nine months working for an oil company as a financial analyst, uh, and then went to law school, SMB Law School, got out as fast as I could, um, and uh, I prayed that I would pass the bar. And fortunately, I did. So we've had a plague of Longhorns on this show. Tommy Fibich, uh, both of us, both of us. Um, the well, I'm, I'm drawing a blank on the most famous criminal lawyer in Houston, Ken Schaefer. Ken Schaefer. Um, Why did you decide to go to UT? Well, my four older brothers went to UT. Uh, like I said, I'm number five. Number three still holds the sack record. At yours at Texas, both career and single season. And that's your brother Kiki. Correct. Or did you play football at UT? Nope. Okay. No, no, no. You look like you maybe could still go out. You know, I was at uh, Carabas the other day, and, and Johnny went up to me and he said, hey, looks like you still play, play football. I looked at him and I said, you shouldn't be fat shaming your clientele <laughs> before lunch. That's just not that's not the thing to do. Uh, but, yeah, I need to find my neck. I have, I've, I've lost it somewhere. No, it's all muscle. It's a muscle. <laughs> So uh, from UT, you studied business, and then did you take any time off, or did you go straight to SMU? Uh, I took some time off, so I graduated a little bit early. That It helps to place out of a lot of Spanish. So now That sounds like cheating. It does, it does. Um, but yeah, working for, at the time, it was Oryx Energy. At the time, it was the largest independent oil and gas exploration production company in the country. And I did some finance work with them for a while, but always knew that I wanted to go to law school. And at the time, I thought I wanted to be a corporate commercial transaction type lawyer. And then at SMU, I discovered trial advocacy, and I realized this is like playing football, but with a tie on. I like this. 
So you just said something really interesting. You said you knew you always wanted to go to law school. How, t tell me about that. Um, where I grew up, down the street, uh, and I never really met him or talked to him, but by reputation, Racehorse Haynes lived about a mile from my house. Where I'd ride by, by his house every day, and I'd hear stories about him. And I just thought that would be a neat way to, to make a living is, is being a lawyer. And then when I got in the business school at Texas, I really liked the business side of it. I liked the, the, the transaction side of business, the finance side of business. Uh, I still am uh, kind of a frustrated entrepreneur. So uh, that's why in the litigation side, I, I, I gravitated towards more commercial business, oil and gas, real estate, or for governance, that type of litigation. So did you do a bunch of uh, moot court mock trial stuff at SMU? I did a little bit, not too much. Um, I, I was always one of those guys that uh, I never really liked law school. And I liked the Wally, law. you are preaching to the choir. <laughs> I was a solid C-plus student. Man, I just love law school. It was uh, it was just one of those things that was still a little bit foreign to me. And, I, and um, I loved going to SMU because the size of the classes in the school was so much smaller than what I was used to at UT. So I did like all of that. But uh, at the end of the day, I was just ready to get out. I was I was ready to make a living and, and start to pay a, a car payment. So Now, were you at SMU uh, during the, the permanent ban for football or just after or just before? Uh, I was there just after. So you were probably the best football player on right, the campus. Right, 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 right. Well, my... At the time, girlfriend, now wife, uh, was finishing her undergrad at SMU. And so she was devastated because she was raised knowing she was going to go to SMU, so excited about football. And then they took it away right before she got there. So it's hmm. a pretty wild story yeah. in and of itself. So after law school, did you, you went to, came back to practice here? I did. So there was a firm, uh, it was called McFall and Sartwell. And Phenomenal lawyers from around some of the best firms in town. Um, just great place to learn, a great place to have good mentors. Um, we had a great class of like four or five people. Just just a lot of fun, a lot of work. Um, but after two years, I realized that firm was more of an insurance defense boutique, a lot of med mal stuff. We had Dow... Uh, Corning and, and some of the breast implant litigation back in the day, in the, in the early 90s. And I just knew that I wanted to get more into the commercial, the business side of the practice. So I picked up the phone one day. I had just played golf with a guy named Jim Leahy. And he had such a great reputation as an oil and gas trial lawyer. And he did a lot of other things, but that's what I knew him at. And I saw him playing golf with his son, and I looked to see just what a great dad he was. And I go, you can be a top-notch lawyer and be a great dad at the same time. I want to work with that guy. So I picked up the phone and I said, hey, I'm looking to move. And he said, come over. By 10 o'clock that morning, I was working. At and that was at the time Brown, Parker, Leahy? Brown, Parker, and Leahy. And we, uh, there was a small Thompson Knight office here at the time. A few years later, we became the Houston office of Thompson Knight. Were you, were you at, uh, what was that, two Allen Center, one right. Allen Center? Right. Yeah. Okay, great, yeah, because I- Great group of lawyers. I told, you, fun. I told you offline, that's where I, I worked there in the summer, well, the predecessor name, but the same firm for a couple of years. And then, so that merged in with Thompson Knight roughly when? 99? Uh, but I assume kind of nothing really changed for you except the name right. on the door. A little bit more bureaucracy, but- our trial team in Houston was just, um, I, I learned what it was like to be what I call a real partner, um, working for those guys. Um, if I needed help with anything, if I needed help with a client, if I needed help at a very low rate to go try a case, the senior guys were happy to do it, no matter, no ifs, ands, or buts. Um, just a great community to grow up as and then we'll get into some of your more notable uh, cases and arbitrations, but that probably opened up uh, a kind of a larger scope oh, yeah. for, for y'all with the having a, I guess not necessarily a national firm, but definitely a large regional right. size firm. Uh, okay, so, but at some point you 
want, you wish to go do something a little bit more autonomous. Uh, so I understand you left. Uh, what year did you go to Buck Keenan? 2010. So I've been there 13 years. Uh, and Buck Keenan, you know, Buck and Keenan have been gone for a while. Um, none of us like our names, so we keep their names. Um, and uh, I've got great partners over there. It's a it's a boutique, ten lawyer, commercial litigation uh, firm. Um, you know, just a broad range of real estate, construction, oil and gas, uh, fiduciary duties, or governance, you name it. Um, it's easy what it's easy to say what we don't do. Really, we don't do family, criminal, a lot of things that bleed, uh, and. And that sort of thing. Is this mostly commercial litigation, company to company fights? Yeah. Oh, um, yes, for the most part, yes. But and so, how many partners? Uh, five. And th five associates yeah. or slash of counsel. Right. Good. Okay. So, what? Just for we try to be informational and helpful to lawyers. So, that calculation for you, you know, being at a, a large local but local firm, and then being at a large law firm, and then the decision to want to go out on your Roughly on your own, where you you call the shots. How did that how did that calculus come about? Uh, decision come about. Uh, good question. So let me go back a little bit to say, as an associate of Brown Parker and Leahy, I felt like I had more say so in what we were doing as a firm than as a senior partner at Thompson and Knight. Um. And so that kind of say so in the business and say so in the firm and kind of where we're going and what good decisions to make um, was something that was a little bit lacking towards the latter part of Thompson and Knight. I've got to confess one thing. My father uh, passed away and that realization was don't put off for tomorrow what you want to do today. And so that kind of shifted my thought process to say I always wanted to be a little bit more entrepreneurial uh, in my law practice, this allowed me to, and I also wanted to do a few more things kind of in parallel with that. Um, and so that kind of woke me up to do that, kind of got me into politics a little bit. All right, we'll get into that. So, and you have three boys, three sons, and how old are they? I have a, a 27 year old married with a mortgage, makes me so happy to say that. Um, and then my middle and my youngest are still in, in college, my middle's at Texas Tech, and and my baby is starting a sophomore year at UT. Oh, good. Okay. I've got a junior there at UT. I know. Uh, that's the last of my college ones. There you go. Uh, the um, but So that, but that was kind of gutsy because at that point that you left to go into the entrepreneurial firm, your kids were still probably, what, middle school-ish? Yeah. So you still, I mean, you had some college expenses coming up and lots of, Lots of obligations, but I guess it probably opened up a lot of ability for you to do some things that dads should do, kind of like you're talking about with Mr. Leahy. Oh, yeah. I, look, I coached 15, maybe 16 years of youth football. Uh, th that's the kind of thing that I said I wanted to do kind of in parallel with practicing law. It's kind of the idea of work hard, serve hard, play hard. I don't know that I played all that hard, but I'm trying to. Um, and And... Again, everyone has their, their wake-up call in some form of their life. That just happened to be. Yeah, look, I, I, I never worried about going off and doing something a little more entrepreneurial because um, it just, you know, if, if you have confidence in yourself and the team that you're with, it usually all falls in place. Yeah. So, okay, going... You referenced the fact that you'd done a lot of, you started being able to do more things in the community. Correct. Public service wise. Ultimately, that's culminated with you running for state representative in, is that 22? Election was 2022. Okay. And you had uh, fairly, there, someone who retired to open that seat up. So Jim Murphy had been the state rep there for over a decade. And uh, he was a friend. Um, and he kind of, called one day and said, I may not run. I never blew it off, never thought anything of it. And then word started getting out, and I got a call from him, and he said, hey, word's getting out. I'm, I'm doing a press release in two hours. And I remember it was September of 2021, and I looked at Melissa, my wife, and I said, what do you think? She said, let's do it. She, re she says she didn't say that, or she regrets saying that, but 
She said it. And so we started and we were all in ever since. Um, look, this district, this West Houston area is a really special place. It's just a, a community where a lot of folks come back and raise their kids. And um, it's, it's unlike a lot of places in Texas. And the rough boundaries are north is I-10. Right. And then the eastern ridge is, is 610 roughly? Well, yeah, it's further west than that. It's more Chimney Rock. And then he goes to Westheimer and then Highway 6. So it's a long rectangle. Pretty pretty clean as far as districts go, right. the boundary-wise. Uh, and so roughly how many people are in the district? About 175,000, 180,000. And you had a couple in the election, I guess, in the primary, which that for that district, the primary is where probably the real election is. Not a big Democratic presence in that. With an open primary like that, an open seat like that, um, I looked at it as service. Look, re- being in the state house pays you $600 a month. So you, you, you do it because you want to serve and you don't do it to make money. Because uh, all it does is take away from your law practice in some way, shape, or form. So I thought, okay, I'm going to step in and serve in this capacity. Little did I know is, or my friends, and when I say friends, friends, um, decided they wanted to run for that seat too. So we had this primary and then a runoff, um, and it was it was pretty intense. If you've never done it, uh, I don't know that I recommend it. The So do you remember what the kind of rough vote numbers were for the runoff where, that you prevailed in, like how many uh, votes you got versus it was it was, a, it was a pretty uh, tight market. It was, it was one and a half percent, maybe two. Um, but uh, do you remember? Um, but it was, again, in roughly thousands of votes, it was in the hundreds. So it, it was interesting to me because my wife and your brother in law, and then the candidate you beat, Shelly Barano, her brother, they were all in the same class at Memorial. And then I assume you and Shelly were at least in school at some point. Oh, oh, it's e- even better. So Shelly and I were a year apart in high school. We've known each other for a long, long time. Her brother-in-law was a tailback that I blocked for in high school. Who's that? Uh, Mark Barino. Yeah. And then her husband, Newt, and I were C-club members together and worked together real closely there. The Barinos lived next door to the Lights for a number of years. That's your brother-in-law's right. family. Yeah. And so, so there's, I mean, this community, the tightness of, of you know, everyone that we knew in common um, made it a little bit less comfortable. But also, hopefully not. I I didn't see any like no. crazy. I was going to say negative politics. Don't these people that long, you really got nuclear weapons to use against them. <laughs> no, no, no. This was a very positive campaign. No one threw any mud. Um, it was. Uh, I don't know how else to describe it. Well, it's good for you, but really yeah. not that interesting for our podcast. Right, right, right. Next time around, right. Oh. Uh, that, that's the way it should be, of course. And then, so there, you win the primary. Uh, assume you win win the general by a very comfortable margin. Yes, uh, but we had a Democrat and a Libertarian running in that race, so you know there was it wasn't an unopposed race. We we had a big campaign, and that district is not as uh, red leaning as it might have been in years past. Yeah. Okay. Well, the um, one of the things I I think is interesting is. People, probably civics is not as well uh, known as it should be in this country. Correct. Um, I assume a lot of people don't even know exactly what what is the state legislature, what's the House. And the, I mean, they kind of know House and Senate, but maybe not so well. Uh, this is a typically a six-month, every-other-year job on on paper, I right. guess, right? But, of course, there is an inter- make it sound longer than it is. Five months. That's how I sold it to Melissa. Okay, five months. Yeah, three thousand dollars, Melissa. Right, yeah. right, right. That I get to spend any way I want. Yeah. By the way, no, you're not counting. You're not counting your per diem. That's right. On right. top of that, Peter's kids each have a six hundred dollar tab at the cloakroom. Right. And I think <laughs> somewhere <laughs> wiggle. I think it's the wiggle room is a, <laughs> is a new place. But look, what, what, you know, now special sessions have become common, so it drags out a little further, a little more. And so you go in November, you win Correct. formally. I guess you kind of probably started maybe, maybe, no. you're, maybe you're, November we win. Okay. Nothing for granted. Yeah. I was going to say you're probably, uh, didn't want to jinx anything. Right. 
so November comes in. How is what is the preparation for from that point to like, hey, you're you're about to start in January hot. Bills are already starting to get filed, and I think December. So how how do you prepare yourself, or or how do others help prepare you for the session? Well, let me give a shout out to just my partners and the lawyers at Buck Keenan. Um, you know, they they've just been awesome. They've helped out in every way, shape they can. Uh, they've helped with clients. They've helped with cases. Uh, and during the campaign, I mean, we tried a $100 million arbitration during the first week of early voting during the primary. Um, and we tried another one about a third as big about three weeks later. I mean, big bet the company type stuff. Um, and so you just have to juggle both. You have a campaign team that says, I don't know if they were joking or not, but you're doing better in the polls and you're not around. You're like Biden in the basement. Just stay away. You only hurt your campaign. I don't think they meant, but, but the, the point is, is, you know, you got to take care of your business. So, so then, so they're helping you with that. But then as far as prepping, getting up to speed on what you need to do to be a, an effective legislator, right. uh, how did you go about doing that? So, uh, let me back up a little bit. Um, so I've been working over the years. Uh, I was an a, a appointee uh, by Governor Abbott to the Texas Board of Criminal Justice, which is the prison system and the Wyndham School District, which is part of the school district for the prison system. We have 90 some prisons across the, the state, a three plus billion dollar budget. Um, and working on that for five and a half years, you get an insight to the legislative process in some respect. Working on legislation also on the outside, when we were at C-Club, we'd work on, if you remember when Bill King ran for mayor, he screamed about, we're going bankrupt, city of Houston's going broke because of our pension problems. Well, we actually passed a pension reform bill in 2017, and I was involved in that, um, in that whole process. So seeing the legislature work, and then some other legislation that's uh, come in and out, helping in that respect as well. So I kind of had an insight of the legislature uh, before deciding to run. But there's nothing like being in it to really understand it. I was going to say, did, did your expectation, was it met or a little bit different? Um, of course it was different. But like anything else, whatever subject matter, whatever case you're working on, if it's a new subject matter, a new industry, or a new area of law, and you have to go learn it, right? Same thing in the legislature. Here's something else. Okay, we're used to doing this on a case-by-case -case basis. The same thing with legislation. You go in and you study it. Actually, I think as lawyers, we're pretty well trained to do this function. Sure. And I don't mean just because it's laws and laws. I mean because it's subject matter. You need to trust people who know it better in some respects. But you're going to dig into new things. And you're going to be more amenable to do that. Um because of your practice, because you do that on a regular basis. Have you continued with an interest in criminal justice stuff? I'm interested in criminal justice as it, as it pertains to rehabilitation post-incarceration and, and elsewhere. I mean, in the diversionary stuff that is in lieu of incarceration, that sort of thing. That's where my focus has been. Uh, Texas really does, relative to other states, a very good job of providing opportunities for those that may have hit rock bottom in prison to find ways to get out when they do get released. And we really do a good job of that. We had worked much with John Whitmire on that stuff. Uh, I didn't work with him. I saw the work that he did, uh, and I'm aware of the work that he did. Um, and yeah, he is passionate about the prison system and he's been a, a huge advocate for some of this rehabilitative stuff. I've, I've heard him speak on that. Yeah. A couple he's, of times. he's, He's solid. We had Kelly Johnson, judge of uh, okay. the 178th here on, well, it posted this past week, but she talked at length about her passion for the drug court and how, and kind of told us how that works. And it sounds like that's the kind of thing you're talking about. Just let's get beyond this. You get charged, you get arrested, you go to jail, you sit in jail being unproductive for 20 years. Let's think of ways to figure out ways around. There's a happy median. If you go too far to one direction, you're just creating a revolving door. Sure. And if you go too far in, in the other direction, 
you're really wasting lives. So where where is that happy medium? There are folks that know that subject matter and that behavior pattern a lot better than I do. So how do you, for the five plus months that you were in session, how do you juggle your law practice with that? Do you really have to count 100% on your partners? Very poorly. Yeah. <laughs> um, no, I do. I do. I count on my partners. Um, there will be mediations, depositions um, that, you know, if I can, if we're done on Friday, we know we're not going to have session on Friday, I'll go and take that deposition that day and try to make it work after hours. But look, Texas, if it was its own country, our economy, we'd be the ninth largest in the world. And yet our legislature meets every other year for five months. Um, $300 plus billion dollar budget. Um, our surplus is larger than the budgets of several states, dozens of states. Um, so so I'm, I'm putting it in kind of scale. When we get into session, especially when March comes through the end of May, it's almost 24-7. It's, it's your, you're sprinting. You're, it's like in trial, uh, that kind of mentality. Um, and so they're really, when that happens, you, it's really hard to devote anything to other than emails and phone calls. So, and I do rely on my partners. And if I haven't given those shout out yet, they're the best in the world. And if anyone's looking for legal services, somebody are the best. For a promotion. <laughs> <laughs> Bud Keenan. Peter and I would probably sit here and ask you questions about your time in the legislature yeah. until they turn the lights in the building out. Um, but maybe just a couple of, uh, highlights. Is there anything particularly proud of or impressed with uh, your time here for your fir through your first legislative session? And maybe a follow-up, like anything you really feel like slipped away or, or could have gone better for uh, you in the legislative session? That's a loaded question. Well, you but, could say nothing. You say, Kyle, everything was amazing, peaches and cream the entire time, and we well, will probably believe you. So, so I, will, I, will, I will start this way. Thank goodness that we live in Texas instead of some of these other states that have some other real significant problems. We start with a $33 billion surplus. We are constitutionally prohibited from spending over a certain amount, which has a threshold of population growth and inflation. And this, you know. So we are a, a, a fiscally well-situated, at least here recently, uh, state. Our rainy day fund is, is overflowing and, and we're in great shape. So you start with, with a place where you're not in horrible shape. And then it's how do you improve it? And everyone's got different ideas. Uh, and the funny thing is, you know, the Republicans control the House and the Senate, but we don't agree on a lot of things. Internally. Uh, internally. Yeah. That's right. It's how to do it. Like we gave the largest property tax uh, cut uh, in the history of the state of Texas. Some say in the history of the recorded world. I'll just not verify that. But it was large. We were arguing for months not on whether to give it back, but how to give it. It's not someone said, oh, we want to spend it here. There's a higher and best use to spend it over here. And someone says, no, we want to give it back. It was, we want to give it back. How do we do it? And so we argued about that for several months. We finally got that. Um, let me, there's a lot of big stuff that we, a lot of big stuff. But let me kind of focus on a nuanced issue that um, kind of hits close to home. Uh, we have in Houston and Harris County, we have the Houston Housing Authority, which is appointed by the governor, excuse me, appointed by the mayor, not city council, not county commissioner, but the mayor. And over the years, the Houston Housing Authority has been permitting what's called these public facility corporations, PFCs, and you've probably never heard of this. And what they would do is they would allow these apartment complexes to convert to a PFC, and in exchange for a slight reduction in rent to half of the units, uh, they would wipe out their complete property tax obligation, which is a third of their expenses, for 75 to 99 years. No elected officials saw it, voted on it, no accountability, real accountability. There wasn't even a place to record these things so that the state knew how many of these things there were. It took over $5 billion off the property tax rolls. Again, many of it 
75 to 99 years. In my opinion, it was it was the biggest property tax loophole in abuse that we've seen in Houston and Harris County. Now, this is a statewide law, right? But the abuses are happening in Houston and Harris County. So before I was even a candidate, I was helping on the outside with some legislation to reform this, and it didn't it didn't pass for whatever reason. And this time we want to make sure because every year we're adding billions of dollars of, of properties taken off our tax rolls. And I mean school taxes, county taxes, city taxes, and Port Authority taxes, all of that stuff. So we finally passed a reform there, and it was, it was contested. There was a lot of lobby effort, you know, fighting against it. Um, and we got it done, and we got it done with a super majority of votes to where the law became, uh, this reform became immediate um, instead of it being effective September 1. Again, that affects this community, our district, our city, uh, in ways that, you know, now we have real affordability, real accountability. We have elected officials deciding whether they want to do this or not. Uh, and then the affordability part is, is, is a lot more substantive. Again, that's a little nerdy. That's a little nuanced. You know, that's not the big headline issue that you read. But that's the kind of stuff, you know, that, that matters you know, day to day, and to make sure these abuses don't happen also gives the public more confidence in government. And that's the whole goal here. Again, like I started, this is a special place, this state, this district, this city, this county, um, and we got to keep it special as long as we can. The um, One of the other things that was passed was the Texas Business Courts. Were you involved, I assume, in being, particularly being a lawyer yeah. and a business litigator? So I wasn't on this committee, but I followed it closely. Um, so, so let's kind of back up. You know, Texas is such a huge economy relative to other states. And uh, over 20 states already have this kind of thing, this specialized business type court. Uh, and Texas really hasn't had that. We've had probate courts in, in larger counties. We've had, you know, the separation of civil and criminal district courts in, in larger counties. Uh, and family courts and things like that. Some counties are all in one district judge, right? So, again, that's the beauty about Texas is it's not one size fits all. Certain counties operate completely different than what we're used to in Harris County uh, or Dallas County or Travis County. And, and so the idea was let's carve out some of these more complicated um, cases Complicated is a, it's not complicated if you do them, but it's different. And so what you would have is you would have judges in some counties that don't see these very often, and even judges in big counties that don't have any experience with the, they don't have the resources for some of these larger cases. The discovery is different. The issues are different. The briefing is different. It's, you know, it can, it can be a real all-consuming type case. So the idea was to establish these business courts that would have the qualifications for a judge to be a business court judge are, are more limited, more experience, more specific type of experience, uh, more tenure in their experience. Uh, and the difference is, is these folks are appointed, confirmed by the Senate instead of elected. Um, and that was a big issue in deliberations. But um, this law passed. Uh, we're going to have five of these administrative districts or 11 districts around the state. So the, bi the five big metropolitan areas are going to start having these judges for cases that are filed after September 2020. So what's the process for the judges being appointed? Is it Does the governor have a little task force that's set up, kind of like the federal judges have for nominating? So... What, what what the governor has done in the past and governors prior to this one, there are always is a group of, of folks that that provide this kind of recommendations for judges that they have. You know, gov our governors have been appointing judges for generations. And he was a judge. And he was a judge. Yeah. Um, and so uh, but the, the statute doesn't require this. 
but in practice, that's typically what happens. Um, and they're two-year appointments, so you know, they can be reappointed. But think of the lawyers or the judges that are going to want to hold this position. Um, someone who says, okay, I'm only going to drop my practice for two years. And if I want to, I'll drop it for four if the, I'm blessed to be reappointed. Um, I think it's going to attract a very a qualified judiciary. I really do. And what do you hear from your colleagues that practice in business or are in business that, you know, that have kind of occasion to be in court? What What's their feedback on, on, on the merits of this? Are they, are they excited about it? Or are they kind of like take a wait and see on it? So the honest answer, it was mixed, right? Some folks really, really were excited about it. Some folks, um, were just not, you know, change is always hard and indifferent. Um, so most of my cases are commercial in nature and, and I, and I will practice in Harris County elsewhere in the state and in other states. Um, and so I've been in states that have these specialized courts. Um, not enough to, to know what it's like not to be in practice there that much. But, you know, you get a feel and you see what the benefit is for having these courts. Now, you know, there are a handful of judges here in Harris County that I think would make phenomenal uh, judges in these business courts that I've had experience with. I've experienced with all of our judges. But, um, but again, it's, 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 the idea is the motivation for the, the law and this legislation is to provide confidence to businesses coming in. This Texas miracle called uh, is, is real and it's generated by our commerce, our business. All these things we get to argue about, complain about, be able to complain about if we weren't pretty thriving economy. So we want to make sure that we attract businesses we don't want businesses to take everything to arbitration. We have a judicial system. We don't, I, I arbitrate a lot of cases, happy to do so, but I'd rather be in our courts. I'd rather have the appellate process. And that's, and the more businesses that, that, that stay in the courts, I think. The, so the critique of this bill to be fair, and I want to get your input on it is we're not here to be fair. <laughs> Perfect. And I want your, uh, completely biased opinion. About fair enough. It. Uh, so, right, the critique is we elect all our judges because the community should get to decide Correct. who judges its citizens, right? That's kind of bedrock of the Texas Constitution. Correct. And the way our judicial system has been operating since the Civil War. Um, and then step two is I think a lot of folks are concerned that this creates kind of a double tier of justice, right? Like one group of appointed judges for big wealthy corporations and then another group for the everyday folks like me and Peter. What's your response to that? As a practitioner, and again, I spend a lot of my time on the plaintiff side. And, and, and that's, why I'm, that's why I feel like it's a fair question. Right. Because you represent yeah. businesses that are plaintiffs and those that are defendants, and you got to be thinking at some point, the person appointing these five magistrates could just as easily be a Democrat as a Republican, right? Those tables could turn, and there's room for abuse if you've got one dude picking these, these you just you just made my argument great what i told my colleagues on the floor is i don't care if there's a republican uh, in the governor's seat or there's a democrat they're gonna pick folks who call balls and strikes and are competent and know what they're doing that's all we care about in judge I, I you know whether someone's a republican at the trial court level or a democrat in my commercial case really doesn't matter do they see the evidence do are they competent are they going to work hard are they going to call balls and strikes that's all I want. That's all any of us want. So, um, like I said, I don't think it. I don't think that matters. Um, I think, and remember, they're jury trials. We are going to have juries, so you know, juries also give verdicts. Um, you know, it's not all the judge. Uh, so we are. That doesn't concern me because I, I flip it on the on the other side and said, even if we had a, a Democrat as a governor. I'd still want to see this happen. Are they allowed to, are, are they raising money or are they prohibited from doing that since they're not, there's no reason why they would raise money if they're not being elected? You're talking about the judges? Yes. I don't know why they would raise money other yeah. than redecorate their courtroom. Other than they're just good capitalists. Right. But I'm thinking, 
I'm, I'm, I'm kind of suggesting that that's a pro because that's a lot of people feel like that's a knock on the current system is the judges have to raise money and then they take big contributions. And there's a, at least for some lay person who doesn't know, they may think, wow, am I getting a fair shake if the other lawyer gave $10,000 to this person? If these people aren't even dealing with that, that right. takes that issue out. I, I right. once had a lawyer from Chicago try to recuse a judge because they found out that I had given money to that judge and that, you know, I give money to Republicans and Democrats and have for a long time. And I think the judge's comment, the motion to recuse was, I understand your objection, but in Texas, lawyers are essentially encouraged to give money to judges. Right. And if you recuse me from Mr. Herbert's case, we're going to have to go to a different county before we find a judge that hasn't taken money, probably from Mr. Herbert or somebody very similar to him. Yeah. And so, you know, the motion didn't go very far, but you know, it's a, it's a critique of the system, but it's it's what we have, and it's been going on for a long time. It's what we have, um, and I think there's a uh, an understanding in the system that we have. I I don't feel like justice is for sale in Harris County that I'm familiar with most. I don't sense that at all. Um, so that that whole system that we have has not been concerning. To me. And that brings up a point you've referenced the C Club a couple times. I'm familiar with that, but if, for the listeners, what, what is the C Club? How long does it go back? What's the nature of your involvement with that club? So the C Club of Houston, and C doesn't stand for conservative. It stands for century. It's 100 members, and it was um, founded in the early 1960s. Um, oh, the mayor, uh, Strake, I can name probably half a dozen. These, but just kind of community leaders, business leaders. And remember... The entire state of Texas, in particular Houston Harris County, was all Democrat. So it wasn't a Republican or Democrat. It was a it was a limited government, pro business group, and and it engaging in politics in that respect. And again, it's on the Democrat side. We're one party city of, um, and it's been there. Hundred members um, has gone on. 65 years, 62 years, something like that. Um, they had a lapse in judgment and started letting a handful of lawyers come in. And uh, and so I kind of snuck in. Peter, I think your application is, it's on file. <laughs> it's, I mean, it's on. It was denied a long time. They're going to get to it eventually. But, uh, but yeah, it's... Um, it's just it's just a really neat organization where where they talk about candidates and they talk about policy uh, and and how to improve and make Houston and Harris County better. I'd like to ask one more question about politics, and then maybe let's some word we're going to lose our audience that doesn't care about it. Um, but maybe one more about politics, then we can move on to some stuff that's probably more entertaining for all of us. And if you don't, if you if this is a past question, that's fine. Um, my kids go to school in Spring Branch ISD, and so I get emails from Spring Branch ISD every single day. And it has been one of the topics that is most forefront on both sides uh, this legislative session. What do you think is going to happen? Uh, we've got this big surplus. Schools are clamoring for more money. Some folks want to kick money to private schools. Do you? And I know I expect there's going to be a special session on that topic. Maybe yep. there will. Maybe there won't. Um, and I don't, I have no idea what your position on these issues is. Um, any chance you can read the tea leaves, what you think is going to happen on that issue other than it's going to be a, a hot topic coming up? So we are going to be dealing with additional school choice, I'm told, in a special session coming, I'm told, in October. Within that special session, there's already talk about how to provide for additional but really more predictable funding for our school districts in Texas. And and I think we're going like to do an annual cost adjustment or something like that. There are a number of ways that can be attacked. Again, so so there's a th – there's – schools, ISDs are funded in part by property tax, in part by state sure. tax, state revenue. And – but there is an, an allotment – that is allocated per student school, and it varies throughout the state. The state historically has said, instead of just increasing that amount, we're going to give more to teachers or more to this targeted thing, sure. or school safety, or to whatever it is, a curriculum, or more to this. So there's been targeted funding 
for, for those and projects as they arise or fall? Just, I think what everyone wants is they want to see our dollars. I mean, we have to be good stewards of our dollars to see our dollars in the classroom. Sure. And not see uh, our dollars in, in, you know, there's a, I don't, where you have so much money sometimes disproportionately in administration or something other than in the classroom in some of the school districts. Remember, we have over a thousand school districts in the state of Texas. So you have school districts like like mine, SBISD. That's I mean, it, pretty, it's massive. It's the largest employer in the state, is it not? Right. Uh, public schools in Texas is... Well, don't look at it that way. There's some districts, for example, my district is basically half SBISD, half HISD. Sure. HISD, I'm one of 20-something state reps. Um, SBISD, I'm one of two. And so, you know, I, I, I'm I more inclined to understand and know I am more ingrained in that school district just because there's fewer of us, right? We're in HISD, there's so many of us. Um, and so we look at SBISD and, and we see that it's a, you know, has relative to other school districts, it's a pretty darn good job. I'm products of SBI. My wife is, my kids are. Um, we want to see more predictable funding for SBISD. We hope to see that in this next special session. Um, but it's all of the above. We also really, for outcomes for kids, need to increase choice. I personally believe we need to increase choice for parents um, and what that looks like. Again, I'm not on the pub ed committee. I was on the elections committee and appropriations committee, but um, that's going to be the heated discussion is how we do that. It can be all of the above. And the idea of taking from one to do the other is, is, is not an accurate description. It's uh, it's in addition to not instead of, and we already had kind of a quasi little vote that, that that was the big stink about it is, you know, do we, are we going to take money from public schools and use to, and use to, uh, for private schools? And I think the overwhelming consensus was we are going to keep public schools whole and increase to it. And then we will add to, to have these dollars follows the kids with their parents choosing what school is best suited for their those kids. And I'll just tell you, in our, in our community where we live, there's some geographic areas, there are no passing schools. They're all failing in some level. Where? Well, Northwest Houston. Uh, I was uh, a board member of a charter school uh, that just got chartered while I was in the legislature. I had to step off. Um, Heritage Classical Academy, and that's where they're targeting an area where there are no elementary schools that have passing schools. We'll, we'll, we'll be giving public money to private schools fix that problem. Nobody wants to give public money to private schools. The parents will have a savings account to use to educate their children the way they want. So the, the, the state will never pay a uh, uh, public, uh, private school uh, tuition. It is the parent's choice what they wanted. And the, and the dollars would follow the child. Yeah, I mean, there's no politics that are more intense than school. That's why I love watching it, because you know, yeah. there are so many different interests between parties and rural versus urban versus suburban. And it's a really interesting coalescence of sometimes strange bedfellows in Texas politics. So, so look, look at, look at our school district. SBISD. I mean, compete with private schools all the time. Sure. Uh, I pulled my oldest out of Kincaid to go to the Frostwood. Um, so we do it all the time. No, we're not scared to compete um, as, as an ISD, that is. Um, that's not the issue. Uh, the issue is, is going to be accountability. Um, it's going to be you know, how do we make sure that we're good stewards of these dollars, that we're getting the outcomes that we, if everyone's mindset stays focused on what's the best outcomes while being good stewards of dollars for our kids and our community, just focus on that. Uh, I think we're going to come to some 
some resolution. And again, this may be the first of many bites along this, and it may not pass at all. Hmm. One thing I want to make, I want to mention is, so I've got these two school districts in my district. I'll have someone in Panhandle, state rep, that has nine counties and 60. And 37 high school students. 30, <laughs> it, what, and 37 school districts. Oh, okay. Um, with no private schools. Sure. And they're wondering, why are we talking about this? No one's complaining over here. That's what I'm saying. Texas, it's hard to do this one size fits all. For sure. Uh, on the committee stuff, as I understood it, appropriations is a pretty premier committee, which it was that unique for a first year state rep to be get that appointment. It's not very common for, for freshmen to be to be on that committee, but we had a couple this year. And uh I was honored to be on it. Again, I want to learn state government as best I can so I can be as effective as as effective as I can so I can get out as soon as I can and go back to make um and one of the ways to do that is to be on appropriation. You get a really good window into state government that it's hard to get anywhere else. So is it, does that process, you meet with Speaker Feel, uh, Phelan? I was going to say Dade. Mm -hmm. Speaker Phelan, uh, and then he, he kind of gauges your interest and then says, well, I'm thinking of this one for you? Or Not necessarily. You, uh, um, We have a sheet and we give our preferences what we happy to do this, happy to do that, happy to do this, this is my top three. And he, he has to go make all the, make it all fit. I don't know how they do that. But uh, he makes he makes it all fit and puts everyone in a committee. And so on the school, assuming everything happens in October as, as it's suggested, how would appropriations work? Because if you are talking about allocating money, doesn't, doesn't appropriations have to have something to do with that? In this special session, yes, appropriations will. Okay. Uh, look, hell, yeah, yes. Are you allowed to get some sort of a waiver so that you can attend football games at, in he'll the be, fall? He'll be there. Well, I know, but I guess they don't meet on Saturday. Or Saturday. Uh, it depends. It depends. Not if they want to work. It work if we have a deadline, we meet on Saturdays. We meet on Sundays and get it done. Because uh, I personally will. I won't miss a game where uh, any taps are playing. Right. And so you got you to watch out for that. Yeah, but it's October. Do you have a player? Yeah, I do. What position? Safety. And special teams. Oh, wow. Congratulations. Yeah, thank you. So I was at the Orange and White game. I wish I would have known. He's, uh, he was, we were all there. Yeah, we were. Uh, he's, he was 36 last year. He changed to 16 to honor uh, one of his uh, classmates from Westlake where – uh, he played who died uh, afterwards. So you'll look for him number 16 out there. We'll do. Uh, okay, so turning, if you if we may, to the law. Please. We asked you, uh, we've had criminal lawyers, we've had uh, multiple plaintiffs, personal injury lawyers. Uh, but as I said before, you're kind of the first business lawyer, which brings into this whole concept of arbitration, which it's a very small, I would say, group of people that, that do it. Uh, and it's at a high level. And as you referenced, we're not talking about fifty thousand uh, dollar breach of contract cases. We're talking about multi millions, some, up to billions of dollars. So in your bio, we were reading you you performed or you participated in arbitrations in many states and also in England. I think we were talking offline about one. Are there some that stick out to you that you you know think when I'm sitting on the porch uh, with a grandkid or some grandkid that may have this inordinate interest in law may tell them this story about. We all dream that our grandkids will have any interest whatsoever. Right. That's a hopeless, but it's a nice dream. Well, let me start by just saying that I am so uninteresting to my sons. None of them want to be lawyers. So I haven't done the front porch talk very well yet. Um, but, uh, you know, there's a number of really, really interesting cases. Um, the one, and I think it's a, it's the point of my career when it kind of came along, was one of these cases where you're you're young, uh, you're conquer the world, um, you know, hold my beer, I got this, uh, and we said yes to it. And my firm allowed me to say yes to it, and this was a case that uh, we took on contingency where we sued the government of Nigeria on a on a failed concession agreement. 
gas concession agreement and a had to do with a, a massive steel plant uh, and, and what to do with some of these uh, liquefied gases and so on. And of course, as Nigeria often does, uh, they uh, they say one thing and do another, and um, and there was a lawsuit. Uh, and I represented this uh, this company called Solgas, um, which this was its one deal in one business, and they lost it all. Uh, U.S. based, Houston based, and you make it, it. It seems like it's a big company. It's not. It's a handful of guys who. Uh, we're kind of accomplished business folks in their 70s now saying, well, let's do one more run and see if we can make something work out of this. And so it goes south for them, and we say, okay, we'll, we'll sue them. And uh, we have this ICC arbitration. It's London-based. It's the International Court of right. Commerce. International Court of Commerce. And um, and so we, we go all in. I remember... Nigeria is being represented by these solicitors and barristers out of out of London, and I remember on July third one year, uh, I get a an email, upset because we haven't delivered something or something discovery or I don't know what it was. You said Happy Independence Day, dude, <laughs> and they said we need it by tomorrow. And my response to him was just the Declaration of Independence. Yeah, <laughs> it work it tomorrow, English people. But uh, uh, so we arbitrated this case. The arbitrators were just fascinating. The, the neutral was a former Supreme Court justice out of New Zealand. Uh, one of the party arbitrators was uh, a New York Whiten case trial partner, former military, probably the smartest guy in the room. And then the third one was uh, former Prime Minister Tony Blair's wife, Cherie Booth. Wow. So we did that for four weeks. Um, and we came back to do closing. Where was the arbitration held? In London. Oh, great. In like an office building? It's in, it's in the ICC offices. Oh, the, much better than Lagos. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Well, there's a lot to go there. Um, so we think, you know, I left to go on this trip, and, and you know, honey, I'm going to come back, and you know, we're going to retire, and everything's going to, you know, we'll have all the money in the world, and of course it never works out that way. But we did recover, and it was a good result, and all that stuff, but... Um, uh, and we came back and okay now you have a gut now you have a judgment against Nigeria what now what are you going to do where are you going to collect it I know several Nigerian princes <laughs> who have contacted me and I'm happy to forward you their information if you will just give us your wire instructions we will forward you yes. just put this in, in your iota okay. so so we came in domesticated the award and judgment and brought it into Southern District and uh, and then we garnished their foreign reserve account at J.P. Morgan Chase, which may have been the only time that's ever happened. And thanks to the appellate courts, I don't think it's ever going to happen again. Uh, but what it does is it requires the attorney general of Nigeria and his friends to come in and sit in your conference room and settle the case. So we got it settled, we got paid, and and it was all good and fine. And, and that whole experience, and I remember closing arguments, it's me and my law partner, and that's it. And they have four solicitors and three barristers. And uh, and they look across before we get started and they say, reminds you of the Alamo, doesn't it? How are these Brits, you know, showing us the, I mean, talking about the Alamo to us. But uh, and anyway. It reminds me of St. Justin. That's right. Uh, but look, it was a great experience, so much so that um, I, I, I decided to get licensed uh, as, a, as a solicitor in England and Wales and uh, every chance I get to to take a case like that or any anything uh, international, uh, I do. How do you get that that licensure from to be a solicitor? It's harder now. Uh, back then, uh, you have to go through through a course, and then you have to take their equivalent of a bar. What I love about their bar is it was open book, but um, but now you have to do an apprenticeship or, or some work abroad. You didn't have to do that at the time. So I kind of snuck in at the end of that. It's harder now. Um, did you get a wig? I, I wanted to. I needed one for a lot of reasons. Um, well, I didn't, but just for, I didn't need but, to offend you with that question. <laughs> but, but just for fun, I wanted to get one. Um, You're the second solicitor we've had on the show. So at some point, we need to go out and spend the so, money and get some fancy wigs. So y'all are familiar with NAFTA, right? Sure. 
Okay, the the new NAFTA is called the USMCA, um, and the U.S. Trade Representative uh, appoints arbitrators. So, tech, U.S. has ten arbitrators. Mexico has ten arbitrators. Canada have ten has ten arbitrators. Um, so, I'm one of our ten arbitrators under the USMCA, and um, just this week, uh, I'm, I'm getting uh, there are a couple of cases, and for some reason, the Canadians like to argue a lot about dairy, but. Uh, it's all that routine, <laughs> something like that. Um, but getting exposed to that and, and, and getting to arbitrate cases like that is, like I said, professionally, it's just really interesting. And culturally, it's just really interesting. Um, and I enjoy doing it. Oh, Fascinating. Do you take uh, depositions just like a regular case? Uh, in arbitrations? It, with the one it, particular, it, that's a Nigerian one. So that's all by witness statements. So there are no depositions. Um, but it's document intensive, uh, it's briefing intensive, and then your direct examination is really by witness statement. You can do maybe a, a minute or two kind of introductory, but the statement is your direct testimony. And then they get the witness on cross. And that's kind of the first thing that happened. And what I noticed is, as, as eloquent and phenomenal writers, although they use way too many words, um, the American system and our American way of cross-examination is what really differentiates us from our, our friends across the pond. We are so much better at it. Even a mediocre trial lawyer that knows how to cross-examine is, is so effective compared to some of our friends over there. I don't know why. I think it's their refusal to offend, maybe, that uh, that may be it. But can you? It'd be tough to be a effective lawyer over here if you were constantly. <laughs> I became a lawyer because I realized I had a certain personality, and I really would get fired from any other job. <laughs> and so, if you were constantly concerned about not offending, I think you'd be bad at this job. Right. But I think the British have more of a tradition of kind of questioning from the bench. Don't they do a lot of that? And and the sworn statements is kind of the bedrock of the testimony, right. and you kind of cut down from there or something like that. But just think if you could do all of your direct testimony. You know, you've had problem witnesses like the rest of the church. If you could just do it all in writing in advance, it's just a, whew. Yeah, what's the first question? State your name. Right. Baton Rouge, Louisiana. No, you you got to. Tommy Fibish had a story about it. Memorize the question, John. Uh, so when they're taking them on cross, though, can you object? Or is that seen as offensive? It is. Uh, uh, again, the the rules of evidence and arbitration are kind of like they are here. There there are rules, but they're loosely, they're kind of loosely applied and loosely administered. Um, very few people take advantage of uh, that I've seen my experience, um, because they they don't want to get on the wrong side or crossways with, you know, that's now the judge and the jury over there sitting sitting at, as a tribunal. So. You just don't want to cross the line too much just to get on people's bad side. We have some friends that just got back from Wales on a summer vacation, and it's a it's a country with an incredible amount of consonants. That's one way to look at it. There's no H in Wales. Yeah, yeah. It, it's got a lot when of you, when that, you that when you first get licensed and spell check doesn't catch it, <laughs> and your buddies call you out on it, it's embarrassing. All right, so this today is an interesting day for you because you just announced that you are running for re-election. So Melissa permitted another she shot. Um, she hadn't responded to the announcement yet, so we'll see. Uh, look, Daisy will invite her on <laughs> next week, and she, she can respond. Well, she she's she's a much uh, more interest more interesting person. Uh, look, I like I was saying earlier, it's an honor to represent this district, um, and. Uh, so much is being done in the interim that is between sessions, right? Uh, and when you are in office between sessions, you really get to be involved in a lot of the sausage making and the planning and, and all of that. When you're coming in as a freshman, you're campaigning during all of that time. And you raise your hand January the 10th, and it starts where they've been working on it for over a year. So being in that part of the process is is huge and uh, i look forward to having the opportunity to do that you are in the legislature and at an at an incredibly interesting time i think 
Um, we've, and we've had several uh, guests on here to talk about lots of stuff going on in the legislature, but it's going to be an interesting few months coming up and uh, Correct. also very excited to see how you do in the next next race and the, and the next session, but I guess a year and a half from now. We wish you the best on that and appreciate it. it. And uh, my daughter just started as a elementary school teacher in Austin, so ah, anything you can do for the... She'd like a pay raise? I mean, sure. She, <laughs> Peter's still footing the bill. Now, that would be nice, but whatever's best for the state of Texas. Oh, look, I, I think there is a a um, a real um, desire to put more dollars into the classroom, and the best way to put more dollars into the classrooms is paying teachers. So, it, I don't think it's necessarily on accident that that piece of the budget uh, is is kind of hanging on as we're dealing with choice because I think they both kind of fit together. Um, and I'm going to bust my tail to make sure that that we come out with uh, what I call more predictable funding for our ISDs and an increased choice for some of these kids that geographically are just stuck. What are the high schools in Spring Branch? Stratford, Stratford Memorial, Northbrook, and Spring Woods. And I have every one of those football helmets in my office. I was going to say, I think uh, first game of the season, This my, my daughters are planning on going to the Stratford game, I think. Uh, this Friday. This Friday. Friday. Everything starts up this Friday. There you Friday go. Night there you go. All right. Well, thanks so much for joining us. This Thank was really guys. great. Thanks for giving us so much time on a, on a special day for you. Uh, with that, we will wrap up this edition of The Dirty Verdict. Thank you very much, Mono. Appreciate it. Thank you, guys. Appreciate it. Thank you, guys. Thanks for joining us this week. Don't forget to subscribe to the show on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. You can also visit our website at www.dirtyverdict.com. If you are interested in coming on as a guest or have a story idea, please email us at story at